Hi everybody and welcome to tonight's webinar. Uh, we are very, very pleased to be back with you all. So if you've been to the webinar before, you will know uh, roughly what's going to happen. If you haven't, then that's absolutely fine as well. We're really, really pleased that you're here. It's, it's fabulous to be back together as a team because those of you who um, have been to lots of webinars will know that we did uh, a webinar every week for two years, basically did 100 webinars and then we've not done any for almost a year, actually. It's a year next month since uh, we did webinar 100 and um, we've missed seeing all of you, but we've also missed seeing one another. But we were also reflecting a little bit earlier about the fact that when we started these webinars, that all of the team, other than me, but all of the team were students. And now we've got people who are, um, you know, fully fledged social workers, new team managers even uh, on the team. So we've got a whole range now, um, just shows how long we've been doing all of this really, doesn't it? So it is fabulous to be back. Um, just for the one night, we'll probably do a few more just one nights, but we're not uh, going to come back to doing things weekly because originally we set up the webinars to look at social work theory and reflective practice because that's the area that I usually work in. And we were looking at social work theory and reflective practice, thinking we'd do three or four webinars and we ended up doing 100. So uh, tonight is 101. But tonight is a really special night because we are going to be sharing with you some brand new resources. What we wanted to do is look at reflective practice again. Now we've looked at reflective practice quite a few times in our webinars previously, but we want, I, I realized that um, as I was taking a look at this book as, you know, sometimes get it off my shelf, Shern's Reflective Practitioner, How Professionals Think in Action. Um, so I'm looking at this book and I realized, I'm gone, it's exactly 40 years since this book was published. So published in 1983, for exactly 40 years. And I was thinking, you know, we really need to kind of relook at this. So let's do a webinar looking at 40 years on from Shern then let's rethink reflective practice within social work. Now, you can trace back reflective practice. Well, not reflective practice, but perhaps reflection much, much further. It goes back to like ancient times and Aristotle. And Aristotle wrote about, uh, well, introduced the idea of what he called the rule of three. So he introduced that in a book that he wrote called Rhetoric, Dramatic Unity of Time, Place and Action. And I love that idea of a dramatic unity of time and place and action, because in many ways, that's what social work is. Really good social work kind of is about connecting the time, the place and our action. It's what, you know, a person in environment perspective is all about. So I love that title. But the idea of the rule of three is that when things are presented in threes, the message is clearer. So, you know, there's loads of things that are presented in in the rule of three, like, I don't know, faith, hope and charity, you know, those kinds of things, they're presented in a rule of three. And so it's used quite a lot. And I've realised over the years that I've been doing quite a lot of work around helping people think about reflective practice in different ways that the rule of three is threaded through reflective practice in lots of different ways. So tonight we're planning to use the rule of three in terms of reflective practice. We're going to have three speakers, um, not three polar bears, but I just thought that was quite a nice picture with a three, but we're going to have three speakers. Um, we're going to introduce three brand new resources that you can use as you work towards becoming a more reflective social worker. And there's also, and I'm not going to tell you too much about this, but to make sure that there's plenty of interaction and that you feel that you're able to fully interact in the night, um, then there's going to be a bit of a surprise for three people at the end of the night. So the team, the Student Connect team here are looking at the chat. So we might be looking for three people from the chat who've been, you know, maybe... Uh, put something in that's really helpful uh, if you put something into the chat or maybe as reflected really carefully in the chat or something. So it's all based around the rule of three. So as I said, tonight is a one-off. We're back as a one-off, but please don't forget that as a team, we designed and delivered 100 webinars 
Um, most of them are available to watch back on my YouTube channel. Now, there's probably three or four, I think, where it was experts by experience who came to webinars to share their lived experience. And we kept those just very much to the night. Um, but otherwise, then the webinars are available to watch back on YouTube and you can just, you know, work your way through them. There's so many different topics covered. But if you're particularly interested in reflective practice, and I assume because you've come tonight that you are, then three that you'll find particularly helpful. Webinar number two. We, the first webinar was about theory and the second webinar was about reflection. And we kind of thought that was going to be it, really, when you think it's silly that we've done so many since. And we thought that would be pretty much it. But number two was all about introducing reflective practice in social work. Number four was about reflective writing. And I think it's still the second most watched webinar that we've got of all of them. And it is a great webinar to watch. Um if you want to improve your reflective writing. And then um, much later, we did webinar number 63, um, which Wendy, who's joining us again as a guest tonight, joined us at, and we looked at developing confidence in reflective practice. Now, there's lots of others about reflective practice, but though I thought, you know, we'll pick out three because we're doing tonight as a rule of three. But tonight is based around one aspect, one rule of three is looking at the past, the present and the future. So we want to spend some time tonight looking at the past of reflective practice, the present and looking at the future. So we are delighted that we're going to be joined. Well, we are. We've already been joined by. But Hannah is going to be presenting to us at the end. Hannah, um, I first met Hannah when she was a first year student and Hannah has developed her own model of reflective practice, which she's going to be sharing with us at the end of the session tonight. So we'll be starting off with the past, with Shern and his book. And there's a poll coming up now. Now I'm going to ask you all to contribute to this poll. I think we've been told in the past it doesn't come up for everybody on every device. So if the poll doesn't pop up for you, don't panic about it. But Chris is just launching a poll now, which is going to ask you two questions. Now, please be honest, because I want you to remember the poll is entirely anonymous, a little bit anonymous. OK, this book, Shern, I think it is the most heavily referenced book on reflective practice, not just in social work, but to be honest, in all professional training. So the first question that we're asking you here is, have you quoted or referenced Shern? And we're giving you the options of yes, no and unsure because we're thinking you know if you qualified a few years ago you might not remember whether you referenced him or not so we've given you an unsure for that one but underneath we're asking you well have you actually read the book and there we're giving you the option of yes or no and we're going to see what comes up here we're asking you questions that we've got quite a lot of people voted already i think 430 odd votes so far keep going because there's more than 600 people in the webinar tonight but if you vote on, have you quoted or referenced this book, Shern 1983? Whenever, I mean, I, I read and assess portfolios, often looking at practice educator assignments, often look at newly qualified workers assignments. And I think I nearly always see Shern 1983 as a reference somewhere in, in their assignment. So I think it is pretty heavily referenced and quoted. But then the second question, have you actually read the book? So we've got 508 votes there. And that's a fairly good sized um, poll there. So, Chris, if you want to end the poll now and um, launch it so that people can see. Um, but what I've got there is 59% um, of you have quoted or referenced Shern. 27% haven't and 14% aren't sure. But only 16% of people have read it. 84% of people haven't read it. And I think that's fairly standard, isn't it? We will, those kind of books that are standard texts that everybody refers to, that have been and gone a long way, we often don't read, but we might quote back to. But in that way, I think we can see it as, in some ways, an important um, piece of work. But almost, do we need to look at should we be revisiting this now? Should we be should we be re-looking at reflective practice, especially since social work has changed such a lot in the ensuing 40 years? So Schoen talked about two stages of reflection. 
Schoen talked about reflection in action and reflection on action. Now, some of you who said, no, I didn't quote him, are probably thinking that, oh, yeah, maybe I did quote him, actually, because I remember that bit, you know. So maybe some people are actually remembering that now as I'm saying it. But Schoen said there were two stages of reflection. And we've said in these webinars before that if you want to fully grow as a reflective social worker, there are actually three stages of reflection that you need to use. So whilst Schoen talked about reflection in action and reflection on action, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about what these are, because one of the resources that we're going to share with you goes into some really helpful detail. But Schoen said there are those two stages, there's in and on action. And then nearly 10 years later, Killian and Todnam added the idea of reflection for action. Now, that's the reflection we do before a piece of work. That's the tuning in. That's the preparation. That's the getting ready for something. But they used the same sort of phrasing that Schoen had done, because even then, even within the first few years of this book being published, it had been really popular. So that whole idea of... Um, using the same phrasing was really important. So Killian and Todnam added this third stage of reflection for action. Now, I've always thought reflection for action is really important. And when Wendy came, we're just about to um, meet up with Wendy again. But when Wendy came to our, um, the last time she came to a webinar, we introduced a model that we'd specifically developed around reflecting for action. So we introduced the prepared model. And I know quite a few people have used that since, particularly students have found it really helpful in preparing for direct observations for example but I've continued to work with Wendy and she's a brilliant critical friend in terms of the development of ideas around reflective practice but we've been supported by the Effective Child Protection Project in North Wales and David um, who's the managers uh, that is is here tonight as well but we were really trying to look at how we could embed reflective practice much more fully into our everyday work you know reflective practice is very often taught as being this is something about learning you know this is about but it's also about practice it should be fully embedded into everyday practice so we were looking at what we could do we wanted to develop something that was really accessible and usable and that would also address new ways of working that social workers are finding themselves in increasingly we're working from home and that kind of thing and and that has impacted on those really vital critical friendships that we might have had when we were working in a busy office and someone would say have you thought about this have you thought about that and so we wanted to kind of try and replicate that so we worked with an animator brilliant animator ray marrett who um actually is also married to a social worker so has a bit of understanding of social work too and we wanted to develop an animation which is what we've done um, this animation can be embedded into your laptop and it also has some downloadable prompts almost like um, prompt cards really to uh, take perhaps you could use those in supervision so I'm going to introduce Wendy now and she'll tell you a little bit about her and then maybe together we'll tell you a bit about the resource and then we'll show you the animation so Wendy it's over to you thank you Siobhan um not so there. good evening everybody thank you for joining um so as Siobhan said, I'm Wendy Roberts. I'm currently working as a social work lecturer in Bangor University in North Wales. Um, and Siobhan and I, as Siobhan mentioned, were working together and continue to work together to develop some resources as part of the Effective Child Protection Project in Gwynedd. So David Paul, who is um, on the webinar as well tonight, um, is the Senior Manager for Safeguarding and Quality in Gwynedd Council in North Wales. Um, and he leads the project. And for a couple of years, I worked alongside David um, as a practice mentor. And we basically were looking at embedding a new model of practice um, in terms of child protection work um, across children's services. Um, and that role meant that I got um, the opportunity to work with all social workers working on the front line um, and looking at the model, specific model for practice. Um, but one of the main things that we realised as the evening, as the 
sessions on the 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 project progressed was that how much reflective practice needed to be integrated into everything that we were doing. Um, and then we started thinking about, okay, so what do we need to develop or what do we need to create in terms of spaces for social workers to be able to have the time um, to focus on that really, because we know that social work is really busy. People are under a lot of pressure. At the time, it was kind of just going into COVID, um, 19 and people were obviously finding different ways of working so we were trying to respond to that as well so there is information about the project in particular on the the internet if you wanted to find out anything more about it but i think the main message from the project is about working to be innovative working to create or support practitioners in practice and to ultimately work as effectively as poss possible with the individuals that we come across within the services, whilst holding on to our social work values, which can be a challenge at times when we're under a lot of pressure. So Siobhan and I spent some time developing different resources. Um, as Siobhan, men Siobhan men mentioned the um, prepared model, um, which I love, um, and I think offers a structure for that for practice. Um, and we have developed other resources as well in terms of working with social workers and practitioners in terms of developing their own models of reflection. Um, there's a video, a kind of Q&A that we did around reflective practice. Um, but one of the things that I think we started talking about, Siobhan, was how do we make something more accessible, contemporary, that would maybe link into different ways of learning, knowing that people have different learning needs as well and that maybe creating something that was animated might offer somebody a different space to just looking in a book or reading in an article, for example. Mm. And we wanted something, didn't we, that wasn't just a training video that you'd watch once on here is what reflection is about, but was something that almost you could bed into your laptop and when you were feeling maybe overwhelmed by work because work is becoming I think increasingly complex we know that we know that the research is telling us that we need to use more creativity and imagination in dealing with that complexity and so we oh some people have said the screen has stopped sharing don't worry about that it stopped sharing because we're going to share the video with you now and the video needs to be shared differently um so but we thought if we could get this this animation bedded into somebody's laptop, then what they could do was, you know, when you make that cup of tea and you never drink it and you've got like 27 half drunk cups of tea in a, on, on the day or whatever, or have never drunk cup of tea. The idea was that you could get that cup of tea and just slow down for a moment, wasn't it? And really just um, put the video on. It's four minutes long. And I think each time you watch it, and I watch it a lot because I'm sharing it a lot with people at the moment because it's great to share in, in group reflective sessions, for example. But each time you watch the video, a different question comes up, doesn't it, in relation to the family that you're working with or what's been happening for you. Um, and so, you know, the team also helped us to plan it and we, you know, we used them to test it out. And they said, oh, it goes really quick and you can't get all the questions down. So we also developed the downloadable material. So we're going to share with you now, um, everybody who's here, the video. It's about four minutes long. Um, so you'll be able to see the video. Um, but then Dave will be putting into the chat the link to the video on YouTube. And if you go to YouTube and watch it there, then alongside of that, you'll find the downloadable material that you'll be able to download, print off and take it into supervision. And just to say to the Effective Child Protection Project in Wales, I think it's brilliant that not only have you funded this for your own staff who have been been using it for some time but you're just opening this out to all social workers which I think is just incredibly generous and thoughtful really around looking at providing um, reflective resources to everybody. So I'm going to uh, pop on to sharing the screen slightly differently um, so that everybody will be able to see the video now. Now we did test this out before but it's always slightly scary when uh, your tech is running live as to whether it's going to actually play. But here we go. Um, the video should, <laughs> I've got to move my little box. The video should play now.
When asked what reflective practice means, most people say it is about looking back at something. However, reflective practice is about a constant cycle, starting with reflection for action, moving into reflection in action, continuing with reflection on action. Reflective models provide structure and support for this continuous cycle of reflection. Reflection for action is arguably the most important stage of reflection, and yet in our work things are so very busy we may lose sight of the importance of this stage. It is important to slow down, take some time to reflect for action. This involves tuning into the situation by looking forward and asking yourself, what do I know? What don't I know? What might happen when I do this? What environment am I going into? Next, think about the opportunities you might have in this piece of work as well as the obstacles you might face. And consider, am I being balanced in my approach? Am I prepared for any eventuality? What do I hope is possible? What am I worried about? Could I use supervision as an opportunity to talk through the situation? Then, making sure that you are clear about the reason for your work, think about, why am I doing this piece of work? What do I want to achieve here? And how will I know if I have succeeded? Very often people say they don't have time to reflect for action, but slowing things down at this point can ultimately speed you up in your work. When we are in the midst of the work, we need to ensure that we are reflecting in action. This is the thinking you do on the job, in the moment. The word in can stand for I and now as this stage of reflection is limited to your own thinking and is all about the immediacy. It is essentially about your inner narrative whilst you are undertaking a task. The questions you think about might include, what can I do right now? What influence am I having in this situation? Why am I here? Or what is the purpose? What is happening now and what control do I have? What choices do I have? What am I seeing and hearing? How do I feel right now? And why do I feel like this? Following a piece of work or an interaction, we will look back and reflect on action. This is the stage of reflection that people often think of when they are talking about reflective practice. The word on can stand for others and next, as at this stage we are able to consult with others and think about what they might share with us. This can help us to analyse the situation more fully. Others might have some information about the situation that we didn't have. Their feedback may help us to see the situation differently. Or consulting with others may help us to put ourselves in another person's shoes to broaden our perspective. Some of the questions you may think about here could be, what could have been happening for others in that situation? What have I been told by others about the situation and how might I have been influenced by that? How do I think the other people may have felt? Have I checked in with them since? What is the other person's understanding of the situation now? How have I checked this with them? How clear is the other person about what happens next or of the outcome? How do I know this? And looking back, what do I want to talk to others about? Who and when will I do this? At this stage, we are also focusing on what we should do next. Perhaps what we might do differently in the future. Some of the questions you may think about here could be How clear am I about what I need to do next? What different options do I have in terms of what I do next? Who or what might support me in taking the next steps? What do others need to do next? Is everyone in agreement? And if not, what more could be done? What learning can I take from this experience which may help me to think about my future practice? We need to see reflection as a cycle moving between the three stages outlined here. Before practice, reflect for action by looking forwards, thinking about opportunities and obstacles and the reason for your work. Reflect in action by thinking about I and now and reflect on action by considering others and next. These stages can help us to promote our professional curiosity and to be fully connected at all times within our practice. stop the screen sharing there um, and I'm hoping that that worked for everybody I do think it's a really um 
good video, uh, enabling us to slow down and think about what we're doing. And it is much more, I think one of the problems about reflective practice when it's taught at university, and I can understand why it's taught in this way, but it encourages us to think it's about looking at what went well, what didn't go well, and what should I do differently next time. And actually it needs to be about a great deal more than that. Um, I can see in the chat people um, really positive feedback about the use of it. I also got to say, um, Wendy's voiceover is brilliant. Um, I just think it's so calming and we, I don't know where the voice came from. It was just lovely. Um, so I, there was no way I was going to do the voiceover of that. So, But I do think there's a lot in there, although it's a video that I think really breaks things down and is helpful. There's a lot in there. So the downloadable resources that gives you the questions is also helpful. There there is also a Welsh language version of the video too and that's very important for us so I don't know if there's anything that um, Wendy and David want to say about the resource specifically before we move on and look in a bit more detail at some other uh, aspects of reflective practice was there anything else that people wanted to that Wendy or David wanted to say I think other than me I think saying... the main thing I think what you've kind of said a little bit already Siobhan was just that I think that the video actually gives you a reflective space in itself. So when people aren't sure if you've got that time and you're not really sure how you can get into that mode of reflective practice, you can just stick the video on, you can watch a bit of it, you can run through it all. And I think just seeing the interconnections between the three, and at the beginning of the video, it says about reflection being a continuous cycle. And I think it's really important that we start thinking about it and framing it in that way so that it's something that we just embed all the time into our practice and we're not just picking it up here and there. So hopefully people will see it like that. So if you wanted to just pick out one bit of the video, that's fine. As Siobhan said, there's prompts that can help you to structure it a bit more and take you a bit deeper into reflection. Um, but I think just taking that four and a half minutes just to give you yourself that space at times will be really useful too. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for that. And I think what's really important for us to say is, you know, it's building on the ideas of Shern. It's building on the, you know, Shern's ideas about reflecting in and on action, but it's making it that bit more modern and up to date and and also in um in a way contextualizing it to contemporary practice. So um yeah, thanks very much for sharing there, um, Wendy. So as we kind of just want to really reinforce the need for that reflection for action stage that the video introduces, I think, you know, students and new workers, I think are always going to need more time to reflect for action because we're asking you to do things that perhaps you've not done before or we're asking you to do things in new contexts. But I think it's really important for those of you who are here who are more experienced workers, you know, don't lose sight of the fact that this is essential for everybody. I think we need to spend more time front loading our reflection rather than, you know, hindsight. What about social work with foresight? I think that's really important. So if you're a supervisor or you facilitate reflective discussions with other people, be honest with yourself now and think about how much of your session when you're doing a reflective conversation is about looking back and see if you can change that into looking forwards because I do think it's that I suppose reflection for action that's really important now I've moved to Northern Ireland a couple of years ago as you'll know if you've come to these sessions regularly and when I came to Northern Ireland I loved the fact that they talk about it so much more over here reflection for action but it's called tuning in and actually Northern Irish students so those of you who are here from Northern Ireland you will know that you have to write tuning in statements that you take to your supervision that you where you tune into the piece of work that you're doing. And Taylor and Divine in 1993 talked about this tuning in, but they used an analogy of it's like having an old radio that you need to tune in so you get some clarity about what you're going to do. Well, I love a good analogy. So I went with that, you know, I thought it was great. But just recently, I've been thinking about the fact that <clears throat> that radio on the screen there looks a little bit like um, 
when I was growing up, my granny had a radio like that. She called it the wireless, you know, but radios aren't like that anymore. We don't have to tune a radio in anymore. You just press a button now, you know, it's just a DAB digital press the button thing. And I'm wondering whether we could almost use that as an additional analogy for the fact that in social work now, we're almost just expected to be ready to go at the press of a button, you know, and we're not given that opportunity to tune in. And maybe we really need to think about that and the way that digital technology is perhaps impacting. But because tonight is all about the threes, I thought we would just maybe share very quickly three different um, ways of reflecting for action or tuning in. So three different models that could support you in this reflection for action. The first one is the one that's in the video. You know, we spell out the word for just thinking about looking forwards, thinking about the opportunities and the obstacles. And we knew when we were doing it, Wendy and I, well, there's not two O's in four, but we thought we've got to have a balance here. It's not just about opportunities. It's also about what's going to get in the way. Um, and then the reason for your involvement. Prepared is another one that we did. You might be able to tell Wendy and I like a good acrostic, but, you know, we talked about um, this model in the last time that Wendy came to one of our webinars where we encouraged you to think through pausing, you know, the need to pause, slow down a little bit to reflect on your emotions. How are you feeling about this piece of work? How are you feeling generally? Because that's going to impact on the work. Thinking about the purpose of your work, why you're doing it, the actions you need to take. And then ask yourself, are you ready? How ready are you? And how could you make yourself more ready? And then what do you know about the environment and the wider context you're going into? And then possibly <clears throat> thinking through the decisions that you might need to make as part of the work. So prepared could also work for you. This is a, one I think is particularly good for preparing, for example, for direct observations for those of you in the audience who are students. Um, in terms of the Northern Irish context, then Douglas and McColgan um, in the late 1990s developed a specific model for Northern Ireland for tuning in. And in a way, this is more of a kind of checklist as the things that we need to consider when we're going to get involved in somebody's life. Legislation. So what's the mandate for the intervention? Policy and procedures. What might be relevant in this piece of work? The theoretical considerations, the previous knowledge that you could draw on, tuning into your emotions and feelings feelings, the skills that you've got and you might need to draw on and values. Now, I've very much summarised that there and there is more detail in Douglas and McColgan or Douglas's um, article in 2008, but it gives you an idea of the need for us to really think about the work that we're doing. So that's um, the uh, first resource that we wanted to share with you, but what also today looking at the threes we've talked a little bit about the three stages of reflection but there's also I think three spaces of reflection and Wendy talked about how that resource in itself gives you a space but I think again this is this bit about in the present moment we need to think about how things are different because as recently as 2018 um, I with Joe Finch and Prospera Tedham reported that the three most common spaces of reflection social workers talked about was the car, the bathroom and bed. Now, I want a quick notice there. You know, if you say you're reflecting in bed, I get why people say that. Sometimes it's the first quiet you've had in the day. But if you're waking up at three o'clock in the morning thinking about work, that's not reflection. That's stress and that needs to be addressed. Harry Ferguson at the start of the pandemic said, look, we've really got to find new thinking spaces, you know, because it's changing. We're not in the car as much anymore. You know, I'm hoping we're still in the bathroom as much and bed as much. But, you know, things are changing. And I think what this means is we're mostly on our own in those spaces of reflection. So we need to be aware of that. You're mostly on your own. Because we need critical friendships. We've already talked a little bit about critical friendships. We need those critical friendships. You need those people. And maybe your critical friend is here in the webinar with you tonight. You could give each other a shout out in the chat if you want to. Thanks for being my critical friend. But, you know, we need that person who is going to ask us those questions that we can bounce our ideas off, that we can reflect with together. But a quick note here. Be really careful when you're reflecting that you're not being overly self-critical. 
A newly qualified worker told me recently that she thought she'd become her own critical enemy. And that really struck a chord with me, you know, that she was criticizing herself too much. And so think about when we're being reflective, if you're using that old way of, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, what should I do differently? The big focus there is on what did I do wrong? And I think we've really got to make sure that we don't be, get into this overly self-critical stuff. In terms of the second resource that I wanted to tell you about tonight um, is a new book that is not quite out yet, but is gone to print, so is ready to pre-order. Um, and I was thinking when I realized that the reflective practitioner was 40 years old, I thought we need to do something new. So I did the reflective social worker, um, which has got three sections because it's all based around the idea of three, introducing the what, why and how of reflective social work, the stages, the steps, the spaces of reflection, and then models of reflection, looking at the difference between process component and practitioner designed models. There is loads of stuff in it. I called it, the subtitle was A Little Practical Book. And then I, I kind of thought, well, it's not very little. It's like more than 200 pages. It's not very little um, because it just kept growing and growing because there's so much that's connected to reflective practice. There's stress and burnout. There's moral injury and self-care. There's... Um, analysis there's professional curiosity there's reflective writing there's reflective supervision so there's all of that and loads of hints and tips um you know there's three different models you can use for professional curiosity there's um three different ideas for the assessment of reflection for example but a really key thing and the first bullet point there for me, is anti-oppressive reflective practice and drawing on the brilliant Prospera Tedham, who's a great friend of the team, who I think is here tonight, um, drawing on Prospera's work, then uh, I've tried to really think about how we can decolonize teaching about reflective practice, how we can make this, you know, less um, white male academics sort of, you know, how we can move that on and decolonize it and draw out a lot more ideas around the connectivity between anti-oppressive practice and reflective practice into anti-oppressive reflective practice. There's methods throughout. It's a very practical book and keeping in line with the threes, three team members have contributed. So Kai, whose reflective writing had improved so much that he's talked about his reflective writing and um, Chris, who's now managing and supervising, is talking about reflective supervision as a new supervisor and Brett talking about tuning in as a Northern Irish uh, student who had all of that tuning in to write about. So there's lots of hints and tips and practicalities in there. Another three that I think is really important, and I think I really wanted the book to totally get us to that top step of reflexivity within social work. And I've talked about this before, and there's quite a lengthy YouTube video on my YouTube channel about this. So I'm not going to go into it in lots of detail, but just to remind you that in social work, we tend to use the phrase reflective practice to cover these three distinct steps but they are they are distinct and we we lump them together under this umbrella of reflective practice and I think it can mean that we we don't always fully understand it because we've not separated it out and I think we can use these steps to think about growth and progress in our social work journeys so I would expect a first placement student, for example, to be at the step of reflection consistently within their practice. In a final placement, I would be consistently looking for critical reflection from a student. And in your first year in practice, and I know in different countries, that's called different things, but the majority of countries now have a first year in practice program. Um, you'd be expected to be at the top step of reflexivity. So it helps us to see how our reflective practice skills need to grow as we develop. And so I was hoping that the book would help to look at that contextualizing it into social work because I do reflective practice training for lots of other professional groups for my own CPD and it's actually only social workers that are going up these three steps you know reflective practice is very much the bottom step for lots of professional groups but in social work it is about our growth and progress as reflective social workers so I'm going to go through very quickly because people asked me to do this again so I'm going to do this tonight very quickly go through these three steps 
But if you want more, if you want an academic reference for it, then you'll be able to use the book, you know, but um, you could use the post-qualifying standards for social work practice supervisors in adult social care. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's the English supervision standards for adult social work. In there, the glossary of that um, is, I think it's probably the best place with an explanation of the difference between the three. And Jan Fook contributed to that. And of course, her writing is really lead in terms of critical reflection. So we've got reflection. What is it? Well, we've been talking about it all night, you know, but still reflective practice is quite contested. What it means to different people different things but reflection is basically about thinking actively persistently thinking it's about exploring our thoughts our insights it's about our feeling it gives us connections to learning and it's not just with hindsight as we said and introduced in the video now then when we take the step up like the little jelly babies doing on the screen there from reflection to critical reflection we carry on doing everything that came at the step before but we add to it and what we add to it for critical reflection is we add to it critical theory. And that's why it's called critical reflection, because it's a connection between critical theory and reflection. And critical theory is all the stuff about power. So when we're being critically reflective, we need to reflect on the power dynamics, the wider socio-political context of practice. And it's also about going into enough depth so that we can create meaningful change. And essentially, that's the difference between reflection and critical reflection. Each step we go up, we're starting to deepen our understanding. But essentially, the difference is we bring and connect critical theory into our reflection. And then the top step of reflexivity that we're looking for in qualified and registered practitioners is lots of people say to me, oh, it's a made up word. That isn't it. It's a new buzzword. Well, it's not. It's, it's a word that's been around in research for years. And it's this particular kind of research. It's research which adds in issues around relationships and connections. So reflexivity is about reflection, which adds in those connections. It sees the relationships between things, between people. So as a social worker, when we're looking at a situation, we're looking at what's happening for that person in the context of their relationships, their community, their society, the poverty they live in, the trauma they've experienced. We see it all and we connect it or we should see it all and connect it. That's reflexivity. It's that interconnected stuff. In many ways, if critical reflection is adding critical theory into our reflection, reflexivity is adding systems theory into our reflection. This is our systemic reflection. And then the final bit, the cherry on the top of that cake is it's the centrality of self. It's understanding yourself. It's the self-awareness. It's the use of self. So if you're asking yourself a question like what went well, what didn't go well, what should I do differently next time? They're important questions, but they're right at the bottom step of the three. To get to the top step, you're asking those questions. Plus, what impact has that work had on me? What impact have I had on that family and that situation? Why do I see it in a different way to the way that other people see it? And so you need to think about the structures that you're using in your reflection to think about how do I get from that bottom step to that top step? How does my reflective practice skill set improve as I continue to develop as a social worker? And I think that that's really important. So we've talked about the three stages of reflection. We've talked about the three spaces of reflection. There's also another S word, which is structures, which is really about the models of reflection that you might use to structure your thinking. And I'm gonna come on to that in terms of the third resource that we're going to tell you about tonight. But all of those are linking into the skills that we develop as a reflective social worker. And so I think what we've got to do is move on from that Schoen's reflective practitioner, which is very generic, isn't written about social work, into that reflective social worker. We need to start developing our professional identity as reflective social workers. We need to start drawing on structures that come from social work, that build on our professional identity in the future of social work. And I think that's really important. 
So I'm always looking for new structures, new ways, new, you know, what can we do? How can we do things differently? And one of the things that I love is working with students. And I think students often can show us new ways of doing things. It can be really exciting. And um, you'll know if you've been to our webinars before that I am um, neurodivergent. I have a brain injury. Kelly and I... Um, earlier this year co-edited a book um, where neurodivergent students and social workers shared their narratives and I think being neurodivergent and looking at how we can work as neurodivergent practitioners is really important but in many ways the neurodivergence I think connects into reflective practice more than anything else because reflection is essentially about our thinking and there's divergence in thinking. And I think when we're told that's the structure to use to reflect, that doesn't work for everybody. So I've been talking a little bit about the past and the present, but it's finding your way that's the most important thing. It's finding what works for you. And so I said to you at the beginning that we're going to end this session, not quite end, but in our, our second guest, our final speaker, is Hannah. And I met Hannah because her um, university lecturer contacted me. And um, so Hannah is now a second year student. But when we first met, you were a first year student, I think, Hannah, weren't you? Uh, when we first met and talked about your model for reflection. So do you want to pop your mic on now, Hannah, and tell us a little bit about what you've created? And people, I think, will be blown away by your new resource. Oh, that's a very kind introduction. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. Yes, I'm Hannah and I met Siobhan in my, just came to my end of my first year studying social work. And um, what we what we have to do at the end of our first year is we are supposed to demonstrate sort of how our learning journey was and the things that we've picked up on and some really poignant moments that stuck up in our, on our learning. And we have to uh, present to a expert by experience, a social worker and our academic advisor. So we also encouraged to bring an object along that can act as a sort of metaphor for that journey that we went on. And I started to think about what my object might be. And I was really keen for it to sort of take shape of how I was going to be a practitioner and sort of how my practice was going to be. And one of the key things that I picked up on in the first year was the context of social work and the history and, and how that's kind of created a bit of a power imbalance there and I really wanted to sort of address that. It's going to be some one of the key things for me I think um, when I go into practice but when I brought my object in I created this object so what it acts as is it's a it's quite an inconspicuous box and the idea is that Nobody like nobody's gonna think anything about this box. It's just here, and what's inside is what counts, and that's sort of how I wanted it to look like for me. So when I go and meet people, they don't know what I'm coming to bring, but when we start talking, then that's when all the ideas come. So I was going to hand over my knowledge, my box of knowledge, over to the expert by experience, and they're the experts. So we were gonna then the expert will take off the lid, and inside the lids we'll have all the information that I have as a social worker. So they're the experts. We work with their expertise and what they need. I can't, I have all this knowledge, but there's no point me giving them something they don't need. So I'll be completely directed by what they need. And what I was hoping for it to be was quite an interactive, um, like an interactive presentation because I don't, I, I find it quite awkward to have so like when you don't know the audience, I find it quite awkward to keep eye contact and I didn't know anything about the audience either. So I thought by having a tool or an aid in my presentation, it would act as a sort of an awkward sort of breakdown or an icebreaker. That's probably the better word. And the interaction of the tool was, was great because I, I got so much information from the people that I was presenting to. Like they, they reacted to the tools. They were taking the hats off and, I got they were they were saying all these ideas of things that they were thinking of for it and that was really lovely because it actually became more about the tool rather than me having to talk through my experience for the year which, which was great because then 
all these ideas came out and I met Siobhan and it's become a reflective tool. And what's really great about it, it has so many potentials. So one of the ideas that we came out of, um, so it's moved on now from the box of knowledge. It's more about the Lotus model. So we all came up with that idea because the little petals here are the ones that come down. And it looks a little bit like a Lotus flower. And we like the idea of it coming out of the muddy waters, like a reflection when it initially comes through, you're thinking you're trying to work through it, just like the lotus flower as it's growing through. And then it becomes a beautiful blossom, which is sort of how we would imagine a, a reflection to be, like when we have a little bit more clarity around it. Um, one of the ideas I was thinking about with this, and we were sharing some ideas about, was for effective supervision. So having like a physical tool that you can enter into a room and leave your, your workload. So you're leaving social work behind and then you're going into your effective supervision and it acts as like a very present experience because what I've got on here on some of the petals are PCS. And I was sort of wondering if you could sort of work through those PCFs in effective supervision, it'd be more dynamic as well. And I think that it, it, rather than sitting down and looking, because this is what's throwing me off a little bit, because I'm looking at notes on my pad and that's not how I work. I work more talking to you and it throws me off a little bit when I see words and that's because I, I have neurodivergent myself. And so these are why these tools are, are more interactive and I think that's sort of more helpful and fun. But yeah, that's what I sort of thinking. And we were also having a little talk around... Um, it being used in therapeutic services. And I had an idea this morning, actually, because when we, we've been sort of learning about Egan interviews and when we go in and, and trying to get to know people for the first time, that's a really delicate interaction. It's your first interaction, you know, you want it to be a really positive one. And I had this idea of using the box with children and it could be sort of, this is the child, they're at the center, they're at the middle and they're the core and this is their world around them. And then we can start building, not to replace a genogram because they're, they're brilliant, but in a more child-friendly way that we could have an interaction with the children and start building their world up. And you can add so many layers. And I mean, it's got so many different resources that you can make it so bespoke, bespoke for your domain. But yeah, it's just as we had conversations through, there were so many ideas that we were coming up with with this tool. I just love the idea that it's more interactive and dynamic and takes away from the bureaucracy of which I believe the profession would like to sort of have a little break from. But yeah. Thank you so Thanks. much. Anna. Um, I just think the tool's brilliant. And, you know, I went off and I got one and I have built my little box and I'm going to do something with my little box. So um, if people are, are interested in it, because I'm very much about I'm always encouraging people to develop new ideas and think about things differently. And instead of everything having to be written down, you know, maybe you could do it in a more visual way. But I think what you've created, Hannah, is something very different because you've created something tactile and more active as a reflective tool um, and I'm going to use I bought that one to use in supervision with the next student that I'm supervising I'm going to try and work with them to think about how we can create this as a, a reflective um, tool within supervision I think it's a really great idea just to say for those people who are not from England PCF would be the standards that the student are meeting so you know in Wales you've been national occupational standards or um, so they're the different standards that need to be met that Hannah's put in there but I also know know um, that the third resource that we're going to share with you is um, Hannah and I met um, and did a YouTube video where we shared the tool and talked about different ways in which the tool could be used and also Hannah has written quite extensively about the tool in the book and we're going to try and put something in the book to help you to create your own um, version of it as well um, so that's the third resource that we're going to share with you um, so it's a, it, it actually is a structure of reflection but I've talked about structures of reflection as being kind of the different models that you might use in the past but this actually is a structure so it's, it's amazing that it you know you've built something here that can be used in so many different ways and the people who again I was trial everything and the video that Hannah and I did has been trialed with a few people and already those people are using this as a direct work tool I just think it's there's so many uses for it so thank you so much Hannah for you know being 
a future social worker who's not even been on placement yet and is still having this, you know, really able to bring something to the profession that we'll be able to use in the future. So think, thank, thanks so much for that. It's amazing for sharing. And I'm sure people will be asking you things in the chat and telling you things in the chat. So I'm hoping that people have enjoyed our one-off session tonight. Um, I said earlier that there'd be a surprise for three people. Um, I don't know if we're going to actually do it now because it looks like the chat's been moving that quickly. So I think the team after the session will um, be selecting three people who've contributed to the chat and there's things been going on in the chat who will... Um, and we'll let you know in the follow-up email if you're one of those three people, but we will get a free copy of the new book, The Reflective Social Worker, out to those three people that the team select from um, within the chat. Um, and in terms of concluding the night, we know we had so many people register for tonight and we've had more than 600 people here all night, you know, which is, um, you know, it's a pretty big number for us. It's gone back, back to the early days of when we first started, we had this kind of number, but we're thinking maybe it's because Social Work England re-registration is coming up and people need to get their uh, re their registration, their CPD in. I'm feeling a bit smug because I got mine done the other night, but only just. I'm normally, I'm normally well ahead of time and I only finished it a couple of nights ago. But um, what I'm going to ask you to do is to conclude the session now using this technique. So this is originally designed as a feedback method. And this is like, there are so many ideas like this in the book, and this is one of them that's in the book, but it's originally designed as a feedback method, um, but it can be a really great tool to use to reflect on learning. So I'm gonna ask you to think about stop, start and continue. So as a result of spending an hour with the Social Work Student Connect team tonight, and um, me as, as a speaker, Wendy as a speaker and Hannah as as a speaker and listening to what we've shared and the vi and watching the video is there anything that you want to stop doing can you identify something that as a result of tonight you might think you know i'm going to stop doing that is there anything that you want to start doing and is there anything you want to continue to do because that will be a really good way of you thinking about what you can take away from tonight but three things something that you're going to stop something that you're going to start and something that you're going to continue to do. And it's a really great way of a quick reflective tool. Those of you who are students, I would say, you know, use this tool at the end of a week, one week as a result of this week. What am I going to stop? What am I going to start? What am I going to continue? I, I would just suggest that you use lots of these very quick reflective tools that are scattered throughout the book, for example, but lots of quick reflective tools and techniques can be really helpful. And then I said earlier, we might come back and do some other webinars. And depending on the feedback that we get from you, we may well come back and do some other webinars. But supported by David and the Effective Child Protection Project and Gwyned, um, Wendy and I have been continuing to work together. And I think we're probably, it's what I am the most excited about in terms of what we've created together so far. Um, so we might come back maybe early in the new year, um, but watch out for something that we're doing that you could maybe think of as a bit of a Christmas present. We're not really totally sure on timings, so it might be more earlier in the new year. It might be, um, you know, maybe more Hanukkah, maybe more Eid, maybe a different kind of present, but it'll be like later this year, early next year. And there's a little bit of a hint there, which is why we're saying Christmas, because there's a little bit of a hint as to what might be coming. But we're going to be looking more at the links between reflective practice and professional curiosity again lots of that is in the book as well because i just think there's so much about professional curiosity that the profession again needs to look at differently and new techniques and new ideas and new ways and wendy and i have been um, looking at that so thank you ever so much for um, joining us again tonight. And uh, we're hoping that you found it useful tonight. Um, and I can see that the chat is still going very quickly. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to say anything. I've always had a chance. Is there anybody in the team wants to say anything quickly? But um, I think we're through that. We've shared the three tools with people. Is everybody happy? 
David's waving, so I think that means David's ready. <laughs> Is everybody happy? Are we happy to go? Thank you so much, everybody. I, the chat's going. Uh, it's busy, busy, busy. So if you were here live tonight, you know that you will get a certificate, you will get a follow-up email, and we'll send you the links to all the resources that we've talked about tonight in case you've missed any of them. So you'll get all of that. And if anybody was putting questions and things in the chat, then the team will look at that in the notes that they um, send on to you. But please recognise that this isn't our full-time job. We all have full-time jobs or we're all full-time studying. So it's probably going to be at the weekend and it's all voluntary. So uh, that'll come out to you soon. Thank you ever so much, everybody. Thanks for joining us again and good night. Bye.